<clears throat> Here is a series of images that fill me with dread. The economy, textile landfills, the stroke pictures, and the work of Hans Eichelboom, a street photographer who spent 20 years chronicling people all over the world, from Amsterdam and Paris to New York, Shanghai, and Nairobi. Eichelboom would choose the subjects from the streets, malls, and tourist traps, and look for recurring themes like yellow jackets, an Aber combi and fit shopping bag, or ripped jeans and belts. They're organized in static grids in a book he's accurately and worryingly titled People of the 21st Century. For most people, these images are unsettling because they are a reminder that individuality doesn't exist, that none of us are special or beautiful, that we're all mindless sheep, clones and drones. But I don't think that's the bad thing about these images, or at least that's not what fills me with dread. That sameness, that repetition, that commonality, I think are the only wonderful things to these images. That in a world where we all speak different languages, eat different foods, pray to different gods and live very, very different lives, we're still united by humanity, our sense of community and our desire for connection. And that is something to celebrate. What fools me with dread is why all over the world have we elected to look like this specifically? Why have we gone from groups of people who dress like this and this, who've adorned our bodies with color, embellishment and texture, who've been glamorous and striking in beads, furs and hides, and we wore clothes made with actual care and attention to this, this drab, dull and two-dimensional uniform with less and less attention to pattern, color, construction, and most of all, creativity. It just seems to me that jeans and a t-shirt is probably the most uninteresting thing that we've ever come up with sartorially, but it's the uniform of the entire world. And this isn't to say that jeans and a t-shirt are entirely terrible, and I'm using that as a catch-all term for the sort of casual dress we all have now in the 21st century. So this also does include like khaki pants or chinos and very simple plain like button down shirts and hoodies and sweatpants and track suits and that and sneakers and flip flops and everything. Um, and again, these things aren't innately terrible. I own them, I wear them, they're comfortable. And I know that it's not necessary or even very realistic for modern people to be dressed in the same formality and ornateness of the past. I'm also aware that my idealization of historical dress is mostly based on the records that still exist today and that those records are either of people who dressed up for photographs and portraits and paintings or who were wealthy enough to have their things taken care of, looked after, or who were fortunate enough that um, settlers and colonialists haven't erased or hidden those records either. See, on one hand, jeans and a t-shirt, this casual dress of the 21st century, is absolutely revolutionary. It's the result of years and years of people fighting against gender norms, elitism, racism, and classism. There's so much freedom and democracy that the style holds. But on the other much heavier hand, this look is also the result of colonialism and cultural imperialism, capitalism and industrialization and even fascism. I'm not, when I look at Eichelboom's photos, I'm not so much concerned about the sameness of everything, but just the drabness of everything. It feels like as our lives get tougher and tougher and they get more complicated, we are, we are visually losing the joy and the spirit through our clothing. And it just feels like there's this impending dystopian future, if we're not in it already, that's going to be characterized by dullness more than anything else. And I think that's bloody terrifying. Okay, yeah, first off, yes, this is a hairbrush. I need something to do with my hands and it makes me feel really focused. But let's talk about normcore. Today, most of us will recognize normcore as the kind of things that I've just mentioned, jeans and a t-shirt, dad sneakers, hoodies and plain white shirts uh, from Veremont's DHL collection, Gigi Hadid's celebrated street style and a lot of the stuff we see in streetwear. Normcore fashion is supposed to be the celebration of the mundane and remarkable and suburban. It's all about comfort and function and 
there's not as much of a desire for any sense of sort of frivolity and um, ornamentation and to stand out like it's it's all about looking normal but that's actually not what normcore is meant to be in 2014 when k-hole first introduced the concept to our lexicon in their report youth mode a report on freedom it had nothing to do with any of the mundanity unremarkableness and suburban stuff i've mentioned Kayla proposed that after years of postmodernism, rebellion, and alternativeness, everyone was so special that no one knows what you're talking about. The 20th century is marked by the rejection of the status quo and modernity. It was all about standing out. The art was painfully provocative, the music was hedonistically vulgar, and the idols were delightfully sinful. In fashion, we saw this in the youth quake of the 1960s, the popularity of subcultures such as grunge, punk, and emo. Though I guess emo is more 2000s. So let's say like goth, or even rockabillies, or um, people at discos and raves, even the drags, the drag and the ball scenes, everything. And it was also like this end of ideas of propriety and rules, you know what I mean? You didn't have to dress a certain way in the morning, in the evening, in the afternoon, the in thing was to belong to something niche. Everything had to be in opposition to the mainstream. But this got to such an extreme point that becoming niche, finding a click, it became isolating. You couldn't connect with the jocks because you were a hipster. People found you too preppy, so they didn't want to talk to you. The gamers spoke a language you couldn't understand. And then, represented here by this graph, all of this evasion of sameness led to a place of embracing difference in a sort of postmodern pastiche. This is labeled as mass indie on the graph, where your uniqueness wasn't focused on rejecting everything you were not, but embracing and celebrating the many, many different and alternative things that you were. Think pastel goth, cyber ghetto, wearing sportswear to the office, sequins during the daytime, open-toed boots, or being a punk rock girl with flowers in her hair. But this also would reach its own peak where everyone is so different that they're actually the same. You have so many nuanced little, very specific things that make you different that it's hard to know what that is or hard to distinguish you from other people. Eventually, when everyone is special, then no one is, which is actually the foundation for Norm Core. Uniting this time over the unremarkable mainstream and simple things we share instead of all the spectacular things that make us different. This is best highlighted in the report by Normcore doesn't want the freedom to become anyone. Normcore wants the freedom to be with anyone. Mass Indie is like talking about the dream you had last night, whereas Normcore is like talking about the weather. Both allow significant emotions to be revealed in casual settings. But no matter how vividly you describe it, your dream ends with you, while the coming storm affects us all. This report was and is very sensational, with a few limitations in my eyes, but they don't really matter to what we're discussing today. What is relevant is how fast fashion media cottoned onto this, and it started with New York Magazine announcing Normcore as fashion for people who realize that they're one in seven billion. Soon every magazine and style spread was about achieving the Normcore aesthetic, um, blending in, stop caring about fashion, be refreshingly ordinary and plain. But they were sort of highlighting being ordinary or normal not to connect to other people, but to be even more of an individual. Like, you're going to be super, super unique because you have the bravery or the courage to not be unique. You know what I mean? And it's so funny because the ironic thing with any anti-fashion movement is that it still serves the fashion institution. And the adoption of Normcore wasn't the rejection of artifice and superficiality that it claimed to be. But instead, it became an aesthetic that actually served to further highlight the beauty and the glamour of the people already beautiful and glamorous. Normcore on your mom or the average pedestrian isn't fashion, but Normcore on Kendall Jenner or Chanel Iman is everything you want to emulate. Like Normcore in fashion essentially existed in order to carry on upholding the standards of beauty that most of us could never attain. It's fine for thin, able-bodied, and not just conventionally attractive, but by our standards, super attractive people to embrace this idea of blending in because glamour, having to try, putting an effort, that is the realm of the poor, the ugly, and the fat. 
and normcore essentially in fashion just existed to further remind all of us of that you know what i mean like these people are still beautiful even when they're not trying what a joke on all of you and now and this only creates further differentiation this only provides another barrier to connection which is exactly what norm core as according to k-hole is not supposed to do and obviously at the same time that k-hole had released this report and norm core has, was getting really popular minimalism was also a big rising trend in the early 2010s the lifestyle minimalism that we have now is almost ideologically different than its origins as an art movement in the mid 20th century. In fashion and design, it's characterized by neutral color palettes, superior quality, and reducing the volume on your appearance and environment so that your personality and inner self can shine through. Minimalism as an art movement sought anonymity. The work was increasingly simplified and prioritized the object or what you were seeing in front of you over any mark or intent of the artist. And yet the Marie Kondo's of the world are proposing minimalism as a self-driven movement. It's about self-improvement, self-actualization and self-enlightenment, which is all kind of self-involved. <laughs> and I get it though, we're constantly overwhelmed with stimuli and passing trends and fads and the world does not stop moving and changing that it becomes incredibly comforting as modern people to simplify and streamline as much as we can and, ooh. and since we have no control over the outside world we can't control the way we dress and we can't control our households and the way we live i get that and there are really wonderful ideas in the minimalism movement about sustainability conscious consumption and actually seeking your actualization and your joy and your sense of self outside of silly little things. You know, you don't need to accumulate things to be a whole person. But what a lot of the minimalism movement seems to forget or not understand is that the only people who can enjoy having less are the people who already have more. And in our panoramic world, which is scarier and crazier than ever, of course, minimalism would become increasingly popular. I'm constantly seeing YouTube videos and articles and Instagram posts where people are talking about how freeing it's been to declutter, to get rid of the noise around them. They're realizing they don't need all these things. They're realizing that they should streamline their lives. Like there's no reason to have 30,000 cups or 80,000 towels. I just need to have the things I need. And that's lovely, you know what I mean? I think also that we're more aware than ever the pitfalls of our hyper-capitalist, hyper-consumption society. And we need, we need refuge anywhere and somewhere, please. And even when it first appeared in the 2010s, you could also see it as a trauma response to the 2008 recession, where we all realized that we actually had to become comfortable with living with less because we could be punished for our excesses at any time again. And it's interesting how many Marxist themes are present in minimalism because it's clearly a reaction to a society that makes too much and has too many excesses and is not dividing resources properly. But minimalism or this lifestyle minimalism that we have now reveals itself in the most capitalist ways. It's not just that you live with less, but you live with less that is of the highest value. It's become sort of an inconspicuous, conspicuous consumption. Take minimalist architecture and interior design, for example. Like just search that on Pinterest. Everything is subdued and it's neutral and it's bare. And I can admit some of these homes, they look really calming and relaxing and there's something very harmonic about them. But like it costs millions of dollars to sleep like a monk in a monastery or to be secluded in the woods away from the grimy city. Like it is so expensive to live this minimally. And this is the ideal. Even in minimalist fashion, in order to have less clothes, you all of your clothes need to be of really great quality. Like they need to have natural fibers. They have to have very careful, thoughtful construction. There has to be a grasp of design and fit that fast fashion and mass production and most people's income levels don't allow for. And then there's the industry of it all, our toxic productivity hustle culture. 
I think of how Steve Jobs is so iconic for his anti-fashion aesthetic. The turtleneck jeans and new balances are perfect for someone who'd much rather focus on their work and getting everyone else to spend as much money as possible instead of worrying about their appearance. As our work and personal lives blend more and more into each other, wherein our bedrooms are our offices and our offices are our bedrooms, we prioritize productivity at every point and now we're all adapting the Silicon Valley aesthetic so we can be better cogs in the machine. Why waste precious time matching your florals and stripes when you could start working even earlier in the morning because it took you two minutes to find sweatpants and a hoodie? Minimalism. Thanks, I hate it. In 1990, <laughs> like 50 years before I was born, Anna Chav or Chave penned the essay, Minimalism and the Rhetoric of Power, in which she described the brutality and violence in the minimalist art movement. Unlike today, minimalism was not well received by the public. Unlike previous art movements, minimalism had no desire to enhance the human plight. It had nothing to say about truth and beauty or working against the status quo. In fact, minimalism was a celebration of the status quo, large, threatening monuments to industry and authority that incited anger and literal piss out of the public, but praise and investment from the government and the elite. And you know you're on the wrong side when those are your stands. That what is rigorous and strong is valued, while what is soft or flexible is comic or pathetic emerges again and again in minimalist discourse. Chave explains how the minimalist valued ideas of strength and strength being the power to enforce your will over others, especially in the grander installations of artists such as Robert Morris, Don Judd and Richard Serra, who created these intimidating, forceful pieces that took up space in a way that had no concern for the public or the perspective of the viewer and sometimes even sought to dehumanize or bully the viewer. There's rhetoric of artists being agents along with the government to civilize society. There's the use of steel and pipe and bars that evoke images of cages and ideas of discipline and punishment. They in fact celebrated industrialization with their use of building materials and factory line production styles. Far removed from the contemporary minimalists of today, lifestyle minimalists reject the rat race and the machine. Minimalist artists were the machine. There's also a very great focus on unity from the minimalists, which you can also find in the style of the fascist architecture of Mussolini's Italy. So the Tate describes minimalist art as a highly purified form of beauty. And whenever I hear pure and beauty, mm, it feels a little bit fascist. And also even when you look at the minimalists focus on order, simplicity, and harmony. You see those same things in the repetition, the symmetry, and the lack of decoration in the buildings such as the Palazzo dei Congressi and the Palazzo di Chistizia. <laughs> and even in Germany, where Mussolini's biggest stand lived. Oh, whoa, that's a little bit weird. I don't know how that photo of Johannesburg got in there. <laughs> Now compare these buildings designed to intimidate people and inspire a fervorous nationalist pride to some of the aesthetics of minimalist art and architecture, even to this day. And then we can consider that the minimalist and the fascist might share similar ideas of homogeny through force. Like you need to make people the same and it's a good idea to use violence to do that. And that there is splendor in masculine traits like strength, sterility, and plainness. And minimalism becomes really off-putting to me. I know, I don't know if it's important to announce now that I don't think every minimalist artist back then was um, this much into ideas of violence and power and that minimalist art is bad. I think a lot of it is actually really beautiful, even though it's really scary. And I'm not calling them all fascists, but there are links here, sorry. Even my poor baby graphic design is not safe. Minimalism has also extended itself in blending the uh, very simplified style of corporate branding that we see now, where the logos prioritize sans serif fonts, straightforwardness, and they're free of any sort of illustration or like 
too many colors and they need to be able to work across every single type of media nothing must stand out everything needs to be without any sort of flair or sense of individuality or wit or cleverness and the logo needs to be unified across the web twitter and paper and that's that idea again of unity and sameness and it's just disgusting to me and it's not just that minimalist and norm core fashion share certain aesthetic and theoretical ideas with actual fascism and minimalist art you know the lack of ornamentation the dull colors the uniformity of it all the desire to be part of our the desire to blend and be a part of a whole but it's also that it's kind of fascist in that this this casual style of dress is also representative of american cultural imperialism and the west's destruction of the culture of black indigenous and people of color all over the world it's not just that casual style is super American, because it is. If you really look at history, um, American culture has been a big proponent in sort of the deformalization of dress and making things like men wearing shorts to class instead of suits and ties really popular, women in pants, or even the idea that you could wear jeans everywhere or that it was okay to pair a leather jacket with a fancy dress. That is quite, that is something we do owe to the Americans, but America, along with France, Italy, and the UK, are also the biggest forces in our global fashion world. They pretty much dictate all of our trends and meanings and what's cool and what's acceptable and what's not. And they control so much of the industries. Our biggest, I mean, not, I mean, yeah, China is a, is a growing force in all of this, but if you ask anyone like the average person to them it is a lot of these western powers it's not just that these people are in charge of our fashion as a globe now which like why you <laughs> but i mean i know why but that also these colonialists have a long history of bastardizing and antagonizing our styles of dress as black indigenous and people of color all over the world our dress which for a long part of history actually was bright was colorful, was glamorous and full of ornamentation and unique like idiosyncrasy so representative of our needs and desires and our thoughts and our beliefs, but that they're the ones offering minimalism and subtlety as some sort of idea of sophistication and civilization. Like this introduction of minimalism feels almost like a further extension of neo-colonialism just in the rhetoric like it's intelligent to dress down it's so much more sophisticated and smart to you know be able to just wear navy or an all black outfit you know it's it's tacky or it's ghetto and it's garish to be dressed in all prints or loud colors or to wear a thousand items on your body and you know who likes doing that uh, a lot of people of color <laughs> I mean, take French girl style as an example. That is hailed all over the world, or at least in Western media, as the the peak the peak of elegance and sophistication. And what is the majority of French girl style? It's thin white women in jeans and biker jackets and carrying wicker baskets. I would much rather look at what Indian girls are wearing. I'd much rather look at what the girls in Nigeria are wearing. Like, show me some girls in Rio de Janeiro rocking it out. Like, fuck a French girl, to be honest. And obviously, not like all French girls, obviously. I've actually watched a few videos where actual French women also complain about the celebration of French girl style because they're like, it's so elitist and it is so fat phobic and it's actually so exclusionary of the reality of most people who live in France. But anyway, and since it wasn't enough to strip our cultures and our world of color and fun and pattern, the people who are making these dull drab clothes that are supposedly the height of fashion are also underpaid, overworked and abused factory workers who are predominantly women of color in the global south. It was Western Christianity that imposed all these ideas of modesty and sexualized nudity upon us. So now women wear blouses under their saris and no one can safely walk across the street topless. But it's also the West who realize that they can maximize profits by making clothes become smaller and smaller and use less and less fabric over time and then sell it back to us as a kind of empowerment from our so-called conservative cultures. And also maybe the only way we can keep cool is the temperatures rise. It's a very fragile imbalance and it's a really big joke. Oh, and there 
Oh, and then don't forget how they've introduced most of us to compulsory heteronormativity and that in their worldview, color, pattern and frills and any kind of decoration is feminine. And as you know, feminine is bad, which again, if you remember what I said about the minimalist rhetoric about how they valued so many masculine traits, it's not far removed from what they or fascists thought either. I mean, fascists hate women, like, like we know that. And now so many people will not dress glamorously. So many people are afraid to be ostentatious because they do not want to be associated with the feminine and they don't want to be labeled as gay, which like, <laughs> it's so tragic. Everything outside of cis heterosexual male whiteness has been bastardized and the system is so pervasive and oppressive that this even happens to white people themselves. Like even Caucasian Europeans have had their traditional dress, their folk dress, their cultural identifiers reduced to items that are only appropriate for festivals, museums and special events. That when we step outside of this Euro-American white supremacist idea of fashion and clothing, our cultural and traditional dress becomes costume. Jeans and t-shirt are the baseline. Everything else is a deviation. One of the worst injustices to come out of industrialization, overproduction and fast fashion is that no one respects clothes anymore. The priority is to make as many disposable things as possible that need to accommodate the largest group of people possible. So not everything that is made for the masses does not consider the masses. It's flat. And I mean that literally, like if you look at historical clothing, if you look at any sort of cultures, historical clothing, like there's actual form, like you don't, you can't lay every single item down to be as flat as a sheet of paper. And it's funny because we've made all these developments in technology. So then now we have these really amazing materials like spandex and elastane. And we can make sure that Olympic athletes have gear that actually wicks away their sweat as they run and they pole jump. But most of the world is relegated to itchy, unmoving variations of plastic that have no concern for insulation, sweat, or even just basic human movement. It's easier and faster and cheaper than ever to weave textiles and to sew things. But our modern clothes are like candles and historical clothes are like light bulbs. Like, yes, they both still work, but one is objectively much better than the other. We don't have time anymore to learn how to make and sew and mend our clothes. The handcrafts of lace making, ribbon embroidery, beading and weaving are dying with our grandparents. And none of us are taught to learn anything about fit and body shape and what makes the most sense for our specific needs and specific climates and for specific tasks when it comes to our clothes. Instead, our clothes are made really poorly. And when they look bad on us because they're not made right or they're not made with consideration to the human body, it's actually our fault that we look bad and not the people making the stuff. Nicole Rudolph recently released a video about how sizing became standardized in clothing. And beyond just explaining that when people made standard sizes, they didn't expect everyone to just apply that as a flat standard for every single brand. Like they expected that you would use it as a baseline and that you would alter and tailor things as your customer base needed it. But everyone just ran with it. And I was also found it interesting that she described that once upon a time, shoes weren't only sized by their length but also by their width, you know what I mean? Which actually accommodated so many people better because you can be flat footed and wide footed and stuff. But eventually everyone realized it was more profitable. We could save more costs by not doing that. And that is just also so symptomatic of the fashion industry as a whole. And then on top of that, fashion had become so elitist and inaccessible in the 20th century that most people don't believe that it concerns or affects them in any way. Like I wrote this article for Bubblegum Club about how I think we should stop trying to call fashion art like it's not necessary. And uh, obviously some of my reasons were just that, first of all, fashion is a craft and it's really amazing. And you guys have only, we've only really started coming up with the idea of it being art once men became the main uh, players in the fashion industry when it was no more the work of women who were seamstresses and crafters. But the other thing is that when we label fashion art, 
we distance so many people from it we make it this elitist inaccessible academic thing that doesn't relate to the modern person which is really wrong because fashion affects everywhere like now today we think of fashion as the playground of the extremely beautiful rich and artistic when it is literally for everyone everyone in the world wears clothes everyone in the world is affected somehow by the textile industry i mean we can just look at the fast fashion crisis and climate change for the worst kind of example of how much that concerns all of us and yes i get that the more elaborate and expensive stuff in the past was limited to the elite like they were the ones wearing the sack gowns and the polonaises and stuff but even working class people historically knew that they were a part of fashion and they also had a respect and appreciation for their clothing they understood its value and its effect as something that you have to live your life in and now we're in a place where we all think that our actual second skins like the thing that spends more time with us than our family or our loved ones is superficial and unimportant nothing could be further from the truth I've brought all of this up today because I don't want to move into a world where we celebrate less, where we sit around and we act like it's fun to cosplay poverty or that it's normal that people should live in a tiny house without enough space for them and all their family and children or that it's normal for people to live on less than $20 a month. I don't think there's as much value in it as we're pretending there is when we're decluttering our closets and only keeping the things that spark joy and painting our walls white. Like, give me a fucking break. Less is already how the world is. There's less freedom and less movement, less money and less resources. There's less education. There's less empathy and less respect. There's less truth, less culture, less fun. And it's freaking stressful to me because I want to partake in a world of more. I want to enjoy abundance. I think abundance in a balanced way can be a good thing. I want more freedom for people. I want more rights for people. I want more money and resources for people. I want more people to have respect and love and empathy and joy. I just think that we need to stop looking at the world. Like our response our response to all the bad things of the world should not be to have should not be to adjust ourselves and to make ourselves smaller. I think there is so much for us here and there is so much more that we can do. We just need to stop looking in all of these wrong places. And that is the end of my TED talk. Thank you so much for coming. It's been amazing. Um anyways, yeah. That is that's a real thank you for watching and as always I invite everyone to fight me in the comments and again i hope no one who is a minimalist feels bad in any way i just think that we need to think about these things a little bit deeper as always i'm not trying to admonish anyone as bad and i really feel like i need to disclaim that i don't think all the minimalists were fascist i just think that it's interesting um how fascism can reveal itself in even the most unexpected places like marie kondo or something and anyway Thank you. All of my sources and any sort of further reading and most of the things I've referenced are in the description below. And you are welcome to follow me on social media. If you would like to have a chat with me, comments are cool. Social media is a great place to reach me or you can email me. That's in the description too. Um, if you would love to give me some money in my PayPal, I don't know if you feel like supporting me financially. That would be swag too. It's the same as my email address. And thank you so much for watching. And remember to stay a barb.